everybody reporting to you again from the glamour city hollywood in many of the examples that you gave the outflows from those processes are effectively a saline wastewater when i say saline wastewater again you imagine a big pot of liquid that comes out of the back of the facility with a portion of it one five ten twenty percent of it as a concentrated salt so in pretty much all the facilities that we are constructing we take that type of outfall we separate out the fresh water either for reuse in the same process allowing that industrial facility or that um, treatment facility to reuse water as opposed to pulling new fresh groundwater fresh water sources and two we use the residual salts the portion that was not sent back to the facility to capture carbon dioxide and create new products by using that salt to capture carbon dioxide and create new products in many of those industries those same industries require the products that we will be producing so there again instead of having to go out and purchase the products that we're making it creates an integrated circular economy solution for them so we can recycle back for example the acid into a mining facility that otherwise would be buying fossil fuel produced um, acids for their own for their own production processes etc um, so in each of those cases that you mentioned we have the capability of minimizing their waste creating additional revenue streams and circulating back products into their processes that could be beneficial to them and cost savings. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Ethan Cohen Cole, CEO of Capture Six. Welcome to the show today. Thank you, Scott. Pleasure to be here. So when we think about the world, there's some pretty big issues that are out there. I think of two main things that somewhat overlaps with what you guys are doing. One is certainly around climate change and the need for not just getting to net zero, uh, but also the, the absolute necessary uh, need to sequester the existing carbon that's in the atmosphere. In addition to the obvious climate change action is going to be the need for clean water. And I've, we're seeing around the world where the kinds of usual sources for clean water, whether that's from rainwater that gets stored into rivers and streams and lakes and even ground, ground tables, for example, are starting to become compromised. And there are countries and, and regions where they're starting to have to look to other sources for clean water, in particular drinking water, like desalination as an example. So these are kind of broad, big areas um, that I think your technology starts to hit on. Can you talk about some of those uh, general trends that I'm talking about and how you start to potentially, you know, address some of those things almost simultaneously to some extent? Sure thing. Well, part of Capture Six's goal is indeed to address both climate change from a carbon dioxide removal perspective, as well as a water supply, clean water perspective. Um, you hinted on when you started your introduction, the need to reach net zero and potentially even go beyond that. Part of our philosophy is that the world needs to do as much as possible to mitigate and reduce carbon dioxide emissions. And that for us to reach climate targets that have been set out by governments and individuals around the world, that carbon dioxide removal needs to be part of that approach. Now, unfortunately, because we've gone way too far beyond the point of no return that in order to reach our targets we're going to have to have carbon dioxide removal as part of that solution even to reach our net zero targets i hope that your comment is right that we can go beyond that and begin to physically reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere even from its current levels um we're hopeful at least that we can be part of the solution of getting to our targets and stabilizing the atmosphere 
As well, Capture 6, the solution that we're now promoting and deploying around the world includes the production of fresh water. And as mentioned, that's critically important for a wide variety of water stress communities around the world. And as we see more and more climate change taking hold, we see more and more drought occurring around the world. And solutions like this, we think, are central to how the world can progress beyond its, its current state. Now, let's uh, start with a, a bit of a big picture first, is that um, before getting specific into the, the company itself is when we think about carbon capture, there are different scientists, different experts and uh, pundits that will say that maybe this you know solution is really looking to the soil, the ground itself, whether it's forestry or even uh, resilient, sustainable farming, agriculture. Others may look to low cost things, natural means like limestone and other natural ways for systems to just kind of passively soak in that CO2 from the atmosphere. And then you got things that's more active like climate works and some of the work that you guys are doing. What do you, when you look at kind of the broad market, what are the, some of the issues that you're seeing? And why do you feel that, why do you feel that your company is so critical for solving some of these gaps or issues that are not fully addressed by others? I think you hit on a number of important points. First, let's call them nature-based solutions, whether it's trees or rocks or whatever those might be, we think are critically important. And in no way would we advocate minimizing, reducing the amount of effort being spent on nature-based solutions. And in fact, we think much more should be done in that, in that regard. Planting trees, restoring mangrove forests, um, you name it, there's a wide variety of nature-based solutions that are important. We also think that the world has got to a point where the amount of land stress, the amount of land required to actually resolve the carbon dioxide problem we have using only nature-based solutions is no longer possible. It will lead to all sorts of other unfortunate um, side effects if we were actually to try to plant enough trees to solve the carbon dioxide problem, we wouldn't be able to have sufficient land to grow food, for example. So we need all solutions. We need sort of all hands on deck to solve this massive problem that we have. The second category of solutions, engineered removals, the category that we're in, and you mentioned Climeworks and other companies of that sort, in which you spend money on metal and machinery of some sort in order to pull CO2 from the air. We also think it's an important part of the solution. As I mentioned at the, at the top of the show, we think that first everyone, companies, governments, et cetera, should do as much as possible to mitigate and reduce. But for the portions that are hard to mitigate, hard to reduce, or that residual portion, we think that these engineered removals are a critical part of the solution. You also asked a question about sort of why our company is part of that problem, part of that solution, <clears throat> rather than um, sort of other companies that might also be doing engineered solutions. We think that the vast size of the problem calls for an entire industry of new companies to exist to do engineered removals. That includes Climeworks, that includes many of our other competitors in this market. This, unlike software, is not a winner-take-all kind of market. It's not like somebody's going to come up with the best app and that's going to be sufficient to solve the problem. We have billions of tons of CO2 to take out of the atmosphere, and that's going to take an entire industry of participants that have different types of solutions and different modalities. And we believe we're potentially part of that large scale, scale solution. All right. One more kind of big question before we get into the company specific technology is mm -hmm. around the fact of a bit of a NIMBY, not in my backyard, but also the fact of, you know, who's going to actually own the cost of removal because of the fact that carbon dioxide and other pollutants or particulates in the atmosphere doesn't necessarily belong to any one nation or region. How do we go about thinking through who should pay for some of these services, especially, you know, very large CapEx uh, engineer solutions? And what about the ones that can't afford it? Uh, should emerging or developed nations be subsidizing those that are in certain regions like Africa and Southeast Asia, for instance? You get to a great point. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a bit of a cold, so I'll do my best to drink not too much tea during the interview. Um, you um, you get to a really important point and one that highlights part of Capture Six's philosophy and part of our business model. 
we indeed think that there is potentially insufficient demand in the world from those benevolent enough to want to pay for whether it's nature-based solutions or engineered solutions in order for us to reach these enormous climate goals that we have. If we as a society want to remove billions of tons of CO2 from the atmosphere, the implied cost of that from any of these solutions is fantastically high, and it begs the question of who's going to be paying for all of it. Capture 6's approach to this is to construct facilities around a business model that's itself self-sustaining. What does that mean? It means our facilities do more than just capture carbon dioxide. They generate fresh water. They solve other problems that industries have. By putting carbon dioxide removal at the center of those industrial solutions, we actually augment the profitability of industrial facilities or of our own create self-sustaining uh, facilities that are profitable in their own right. That sidesteps some of the problem that you're discussing. It doesn't mean that our facilities don't require capex to build and they don't require financing and revenue streams, but they're not solely dependent on either the benevolence of a government or an individual or a company to pay for the carbon dioxide removal. We think that's central to the large scale growth that's necessary in this market. And kind of sidesteps the problem that you're talking about, about who ultimately is paying for this. Yeah, I think uh, we're going to get into a little bit more of this uh, in contextualizing the in, in, in the case of uh, K Water and BKT in South Korea and how they are looking to potentially use this and really speaks to your point. But let's get into uh, Capture Six, uh, both from a business model that you started to allude to, but also the direct air ca uh, direct air ca care uh, direct air capture technology, where you're effectively. Uh, you know, the, the process is is such that what comes out of it, you have a host of potential products, whether it's hydrogen, whether it's chloride, hydrochloric acid, maybe even lithium, depending on the source of that. And of course, purify water, and then the mineralized carbonates that can then be stored deep into the ground itself. So it, it's an opportunity where it's solving lots of different things, right? And each of those streams could potentially generate some significant revenue depending on the volume that we're talking about. So if you go into a little bit about the technology and the model, that'd be great. Um, I'm pleased you've done quite the research on it. You're absolutely right. Our process allows for us to monetize um, valuable commercial products as part and parcel of our director capture solution that allows additional revenue streams for us to ensure that our model is not fully dependent on carbon dioxide revenue. And perhaps most importantly, it allows us to sit in the middle of hard to decarbonize sectors that allow them to use carbon dioxide removal actually as a tool, as a way, as a tool to decarbonize. Um, we believe that's central, as mentioned, both to our business model, but also we believe the growth in the industry as a whole. Um, hopefully that's helpful. I'm not sure what else, other portions of this, and happy to dig in more. Yeah, I, I want to maybe a side step a little bit is speaking just specifically on desalination is that mm -hmm. aside from Israel, a lot of the other regions that have attempted, I would say, uh, for the last several decades to create desalination plants have had struggles. I know in California, for example, they've had a couple of attempts and they've shut it down, for instance. And it's because they can't quite get the microeconomics right. Now, of course, Israel, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they've been doing it for many, many years and they've, they've been doing it very cost effectively so desalinization in itself is actually very tough to do can you talk about how your technology brings the best capabilities including membranes and other things that really you know strips the cost out and of course you guys are using renewable energy for some of these things so i'll just desalination first i yeah. think um desalination has become quite cost effective in a number of regions of the world I'll discuss some of them, uh, whether it's in the Gulf or it's in Australia and Chile, there's an enormous quantity of desalination now around the world in the order of um, billions of tons of water being processed per year. On the cost side and the sort of California shutdown that you refer to, um, costs indeed are higher in some reasons, in part because of energy costs. Some recent desalination plants in California weren't approved in particular because of concern about brine waste being put back into the ocean. Um, the Huntington Beach plant, for example, was uh, declined to the Coastal Commission for that reason. 
Since then, however, two additional plans have been approved by the Coastal Commission as long as they adhere to very, very strict brine disposal criteria. I mentioned the brine disposal because it speaks to, again, to our business model and our approach. Our approach uses that brine as our feedstock, whether it's from desalination, whether it's from mining waste, whether it's from human wastewater, industrial wastewater, you name it. But desalination is sort of a simple one to conceptualize. You take in a volume of water from the ocean, you strip out some fresh water from it, and what you're left with is more saline, more concentrated water that around the world, the sort of standard solution is, is that you put it back into the ocean. And that in particular has drawn environmental concerns because when you put that more concentrated saline solution back into the ocean, it can lead to all sorts of problems in the local marine environment. Um, so what does our solution do? In that particular context, we would take that concentrated wastewater, that concentrated stream that comes out of the back of the desalination plant, you can imagine a big pot of water that's at that point, maybe seven or 8% salt. And we're going to take the salt for our process and use that to capture CO2. And much of the remainder of that is actually water that can be used. So at the same time that we'll use that feedstock for capturing carbon dioxide, that residual is where the fresh water is coming from. Um, so your question then about desalination costs and cost reduction come from a few places. One, if you can minimize the amount of brine that you have to outfall back into the ocean, you minimize both the regulatory cost, expense, time, but you also minimize the capex required to put that back into the ocean by reducing the volumes. Um, you need smaller distribution, smaller outfall systems. You then add in a separate portion of this. We actually increase the amount of water that, that desalination facility can produce. So the total capability of those plants can get larger given the same footprint, for example. I go into more details, but I think I'll stop there because I don't know if I yeah. fully answered your question. No, no, understood. I want to shift away from desalination to just broad industrial, including pharmaceutical. And I think most uh, consumers probably are not aware that uh, many industries, whether we're talking about lithium in South America, that tends to use a lot of water, for example, to even oil and gas operations, um, to pharmaceutical and even clothing, you know, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, for example, has a lot of, had a lot of pol pollution issues uh, because of the fact that they're having to process so many dyes. In all of these kind of industrial con contexts, how can you guys work symbiotically with these industries while helping to make their processes cleaner, produce less externalities downstream, and yet still be able to create these new revenue streams as well as capture CO2? Certainly. In many of the examples that you gave, the outflows from those processes are effectively a saline wastewater. When I say saline wastewater, again, you imagine a big pot of liquid that comes out of the back of the facility with a portion of it, 1, 5, 10, 20% of it, as a concentrated salt. So in pretty much all the facilities that we are constructing, we take that type of outfall, we separate out the fresh water, either for reuse in the same process, allowing that industrial facility or that um, treatment facility to reuse water as opposed to pulling new fresh groundwater, fresh water sources. And two, we use the residual salts, the portion that was not sent back to the facility to capture carbon dioxide and create new products. By using that salt to capture carbon dioxide and create new products, in many of those industries, those same industries require the products that we will be producing. So there again, instead of having to go out and purchase the products that we're making, it creates an integrated circular economy solution for them. So we can recycle back, for example, the acid into a mining facility that otherwise would be buying fossil fuel produced um, acids for their own pro for their own production processes, et cetera. Um, so in each of those cases that you mentioned, we have the capability of minimizing their waste, creating additional revenue streams, and circulating back products into their processes that could be beneficial to them and cost savings. And I think this is a really strong uh, argument for the business model, right? Because 
climate works and others that are just strictly focusing on, I mean, essentially sucking, sucking in CO2 from the air doesn't have some of these capabilities. The fact that you guys work in conjunction with different industries and can actually address a pain point, both from a cost, but also the potential penalties because of pollutions that they create, for instance. So this is uh, this is pretty compelling. I want to get into more kind of contextualized specifics around maybe using the MOU recently signed with K-Water BKT to develop pilot facility in South Korea. Now, of course, uh, my understanding is that K-Water is a state own water utility in South Korea that's looking to construct the largest desalinization facility in the country. What exactly are they trying to do and how are you guys looking to work with them? So Key Water indeed is a state-owned water utility in South Korea. They run various water facilities around the country and they're building a new desalination plant in the middle of an industrial hub south of Seoul. At that location, there is a high demand for water and Along the lines that we've just discussed, there's also a high demand for many of these other synergistic products that we'll be creating. We're looking to build one of our facilities alongside their large-scale desalination plant to both provide more water to that industrial complex to minimize the outfall that K water will have into the ocean to, in that case, minimize damage to the environment to the ocean as well as provide decarbonized industrial materials to that industrial complex around us. So it's a great example of the integration and the circular economy case that we're promoting also in the world. It really is a perfect ideal case study. And I wonder how this case study can be used around the world. And then of course, specifically the question that's gonna come up is around uh, structured or capital finance in terms of how would this work, especially when you're talking about kind of an integrated industrial complex solution that's working with other players? So the financing model varies, but in general, our facilities live as independent entities that are self-sustaining. The products that are used in, for example, those industrial facilities are paid for by the clients of that uh, its own entity and the cost of that entity are paid by the entity as well. So the energy costs, the OPEX, et cetera, for the facility is paid by that facility. Um, that allows us to grow very, very quickly by having entities around the world that are independently financed based on the revenue streams of those, uh, of those facilities and their clients. And it allows us to adapt the business model in places to be uh, location specific. So we talked about South Korea. We've also announced publicly two other locations one in Southern California, which uses a similar model around reprocessing uh, wastewater for the city of Palmdale. We solved the problem for them of disposal of their excess brine, which they were going to put onto um, local farms to use as evaporation fields so we could reduce their costs and solve sort of a local circular economy problem there. In Australia, we have a similar thing that we're doing with a new integrated renewables development. Um, a development that we're producing green ammonia and green hydrogen will be solving again their brine problem providing chemicals providing fresh water and that same structural model can be adapted to fit the local requirements in a range of facilities that we're constructing on now when i uh, listen to some of the other startups or businesses around direct air capture in particular uh, many of them tend to accentuate modularity. So I think about this one startup that's focusing on, I want to say limestone, and they, through their research, they have identified that the smaller they can actually crush the limestone, the better absorption it is. And they've essentially created these baskets in a way that they can set out to capture CO2 and then they bake or process to, you know, you know be able to isolate the CO2 then, that then they're able to then sink it to the deep deep earth, for example. But everyone is talking about modularity. In your case, there's a certain footprint uh, because of the complexity of the machinery and the systems that has to be in place to have certain kinds of output and volume, right? So can you talk a little bit about how do you scale something like this, especially given the fact that every region the requirements and the needs and all these things are going to vary you know, quite a bit, uh, very, very specific set of requirements. So how do you scale 
uh, when you have these kind of large capital expenditures and difficult complexities? It's a great question. Um, we actually founded the company on the philosophy that rapid growth in order to solve the climate problem had to be done by using a number of things, one of which that was critically important was by using existing scale industrial equipment. We did not develop a new component in our garage that needs to then be modularized and multiplied a thousand times, proven at scale. Instead, we use existing equipment, existing partners that are able to deploy large scale facilities that we need to solve the problem. The scale of the industrial facilities necessary to capture a gigaton of carbon is almost like impossible to conceptualize. These facilities are so large, you know, we need so many of them, that we believed that you needed to start from the industrial capacity and capabilities that exist already in our economy in order to be able to deploy at those scales. Large scale, meaning multi-billion dollar facilities around the world, are almost universally uh, require, I don't want to call it custom approaches, but do require that they be deployed specific to the context. So if you put in a particular piece of large scale equipment that's known how to be used, a massive boiler or a massive desalination set of equipment, um, these are done at that scale. They require this custom engineering. They require application on that location. And our philosophy is that that's really the only way to achieve a solution in this context. I think that if you boil down each industrial facility, you can see modular blocks, meaning here is enough to capture 100,000 tons and we'll do six of those. And in principle, and in a number of locations, we can deploy very small scale solutions that in some locations we're capturing only 100 tons a year or 200 tons a year. Um, but those solutions aren't capable of delivering billion, the billion ton answers that we really need. So when we think about scale, and again, uh, the, <clears throat> when it comes to carbon capture, it really is, that's that's the main issue, is a scale that's going to actually make a material difference. And, and to that end, because you can't get away from the nuance or the context-specific set of requirements of those specific regions, would it make sense to license um, the technology and the know-how to, you know, giving exclusivity to specific regions, sovereignty, jurisdiction, whatever it is. And then your entity effectively own maybe, let's say, North America, but then really the other services are really in design, engineering, and other support capabilities for those different regions. I love that you mentioned that. Um, our model is to exist both as a developer and a technology provider. And we did both of those things because we saw a gap in both of those in the market. And we are more than happy to exist in either of those domains and exist only in one of those two domains. So if there is a developer, a government, an entity that can deploy our solution and wishes only to license it, we're more than happy to operate under that mechanism. And in some locations, we're already beginning those conversations and those processes. In other locations, it requires our own development expertise and my team's expertise in order to deploy the facilities. But we're happy to operate in either of those modalities in order to achieve the fastest possible deployment. Ultimately, that's our goal. And we felt compelled to do both of these because there aren't sophisticated, capable carbon developers that are floating around in the market that are capable of deploying. But as they emerge over the next few years, we're more than happy to simply license our technology to them and, and work closely with them. Absolutely. Now, it's a huge undertaking. It's a very important undertaking that Capture 6 is doing. Now, with that said, as you look to the next 10 years out, uh, there is going to be a lot of technical, financial, and even political, geopolitical types of considerations as well. What are some of the complexities or challenges that you see ahead that needs to be solved or solved together with uh, public-private partnerships? There are many, many challenges and complexities. This is part of the reason why we felt compelled to create a full development capability. Um, and it's part of the reason we felt compelled not to build out the enormous workforce that would be necessary to construct the facilities ourselves. Some of our competition, our colleagues in the market, want to build out tens of thousands of people in order to self-build. And we felt that to be nimble enough to manage those complexities 
we would work closely with our large engineering partners and our large EPC partners and our large OEM partners. Um, our philosophy has been to diversify around those risks. So we have pending developments around the world and we're aware that some of them may not um, come to fruition given political risks or uh, economic risks in particular locations. But to solve this massive scale problem, we need to begin the realistic approach to deploying the massive number of facilities and deploying the massive amount of capital that's necessary in order to solve this problem. And undoubtedly there will be risks and we'll have to face them head on. My final question slide uh, comment is gonna be for those that are listening and let's say they have some level of sophistication, they know some of the different alternatives and options that are out there. And as I think about what Capture 6 is doing, maybe they're still hesitant or maybe they can be classified as naysayers. How would you respond to their concerns or their doubt? I guess it would depend on which doubts. We certainly face uh, commentary regularly about um, this being too big a problem to solve. The costs associated with the problem are too big to uh, to face. For those in particular, my response is, uh, yes, this is a massive problem. The world has managed to come together and solve massive problems before. And in terms of resolving costs, I believe we're one of the only or one of a set of very few companies that have an economic solution that's viable at the scale is necessary to solve this massive problem. Fair enough. Uh, with that, I have been joined by Dr. Ethan Cohen Cole, CEO of Capture Six. Thanks for joining today. Thank you, Scott. It was a pleasure. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.